Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Daily Stand Up. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. Today is March 6th. Uh, I hope everybody went out and voted. Should be an absolutely fantastic day. Today is here are the stories. AWS acquires Talon's Nuclear Data Center campus in Pennsylvania. Pretty cool. If you're going to have a data center, nothing wrong with some nuclear. Electric vehicles release more toxic emissions and are worse for the environment than gas-powered st- cars. Wow. I-, I found this interesting because it gave some good facts uh, about that. Uh, let's see. The greenest car in America might surprise you. thought this was pretty funny. There's a tag along with that. A new study warns Midwest and Mid-Atlantic grid could face blackouts by 2028. I don't know how to take this one. Uh, Is it uh, kind of a weak sister kind of a uh, uh, prediction? Between now and 2028, we're going to have blackouts. But we'll talk about that one here in just a sec. Uh, I want to also give a shout out to the Energy Realities team. Robert Bryce uh, was on there with uh, David Blackman, Irina Slav, and Tammy Nemeth. And uh, that was a fabulous um, uh, interview as well, too. I'm only mentioning that right now because we're going to mention it in the other story. And then we have Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage, CCUS. Isn't an effective technology or a convenient scam? I'll tell you, uh, I need some help on feedback on this one. So let's go ahead and get started on this. AWS acquires Talon's Nuclear Data Center campus in Pennsylvania. I like this. Uh, Amazon Web Services uh, is going out and they're looking at, let me get you the quote. We are pleased today to have sold our Cumulus Data Center campus, unlocking significant value for Talon, said Talon President and CEO Mac McFarland. This transition provides an an attractive return on Talon's investment and vision in building Cumulus and creates value through the sale of the carbon-free power from our top um, Saskatchewan nuclear power plant. Pretty cool. Um, Data centers with AI are going to be comprising a lot of power. And so they, this one was commissioned in 1983 for the energy company PPL. And it was uh, 2,494 megawatts. Um, And so when you sit back and take a look, I think the only team Uh, The only thing that is going to be able to help the AI or the massive amounts of servers that are going to be needed is nuclear. Let's sit back and take a look. Um, Electrical vehicles. Oh, on a side note on that, had a great talk today with uh, Doomberg and Chris Wright. And they had some fantastic points uh, about that. So stay tuned for this uh, podcast being released, hopefully in about the next week. Electric vehicles release more toxic emissions and are worse for the environment than gas powered cars. This study, I'll tell you, I did not think about a lot of these different things until uh, reading more and more about the cars. They release more toxic particles in the atmosphere and are worse for the environment than their gas-powered counterparts, is what the story says. As heavy cars drive on light-duty tires, most often made with synthetic rubber made from crude oil and other fibers and additives, they deteriorate and release harmful chemicals into the air. So this is not just about the tailpipe emissions. This is about how much damage is done on the tires. Um, As an approximately 1,800-pound battery, and when you take a look at the emissions uh, analytics found that tire wear emissions, about 1,100 pounds of battery weight with an EV of more than 4,400 or more than 400 times as great as the exhaust of particular uh, particulate emissions. 
Most EV batteries weigh about 1,800. It's pretty crazy. So when you sit back and take a look, Michael always says it's a second order magnitude. <laughs> I wonder if the tires count as the second order magnitude of uh, devastation because you're going to be rolling through a lot more tires. And especially as fast as they are, you can burn a lot of rubber on an EV. So let's go around to the greenest car in America. It might surprise you. I'll tell you, you kind of, if you've listened to the podcast with Michael and I, you know that we are fans of uh, reducing the amount of energy used and or gas used. And the hybrid is what this article is really bringing out. A new report from the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy suggests the greenest car in America may not be fully electric. The nonprofit group, which has rated the pollution from vehicles for decades, says the winning car this year is the Toyota Prius Prime SE, a plug-in hybrid that can go 44 miles on electricity before switching to hybrid. It's not a bad uh, thing when you sit back and say it's the shape of the body, technology, and the overall weight. Um, so when you sit back and there's a chart in there, Miss Producer, if you could fly that in. Here's the a plane plugged in top the greener cars list for 2024. I thought that was pretty cool. List price on it was 32975 It had a green score of 71 So um at the bottom of the list i thought this was funny ford f-150 raptor r scores in the 20s so one electric uh, hummer with the hummer ev which weighs nine thousand pounds and got a score of 29 <laughs> that is a huge vehicle moving over to the next story New study warns that Midwest and Mid-Atlantic electric grids could face blackouts by 2028. Um, I'll tell you, this is the more and more I learn about the grid, the more and more I highly, I please, I can't stress enough, get backup, uh, get small backup generators, get solar things to be able to charge your phones if you can. You need to be able to have lights. The, sm the small uh, Jackery is a great brand of uh, small uh, generators that you can charge with a uh, 200 watt uh, solar panel. Does not take very long to charge those up. Um, the study, which examined a number of scenarios over the last several years, found the transmission security analysis shows equipment overloads that trigger as much as 6,826 megawatt load of shedding during average winter peak months at high uh, retirement scenario. So uh, the resource adequacy analysis also shows potential system loss of its much 13,900 megawatts during extreme winter peak demand. Every megawatt is between 1,000 and 1,500 homes without power. Wow. Um, the grid is actually a, a very complex machine. And as Irina Slav, Tammy Nemeth, David Blackman, and um, Robert Bryce were, and I were able to talk on the energy realities this past Monday, it was absolutely a wonderful discussion. And I want you to please reach out and follow uh, Robert Bryce on his Substack, and then also go take a look at juicetheseries.com. It's a five-part mini docu-series, and um, it, it's just amazing when you consider what uh, knowledge you need to know now before it's too late. Here's a quote out here also in this article. There is a substantial amount of fossil file file fossil fired generators that have announced plans to retire within the 10 year period, but have yet formally to enter PJM's planning process for retirement. These are additional retirements in capacities. We have the Biden administration wanting to shut down every single coal plant uh, in the U.S., 
that would be a significant disaster. Um, pulling off all of that base load, the grid has to have base load intermittent de uh, dependent on dependency on different types of renewable or wind or solar does not work. So um, when we take a look at the last story here, carbon capture utilization and storage CCUS or just carbon carbon capture and storage CCU uh, CCS is it effective technology or a convenient scam I'm kind of just teeing this story up a little bit and I want to go back into it and I want to uh, get a feedback please go to survey dot uh, energynewsbeat.co or uh, survey.energynewsbeat.com and, and fill out the survey. We want to hear from you, but I also want to find out from you, get in contact with the show. If you're an expert on this, I personally don't believe that we need to be capturing emissions uh, nearly as much as we need to be reducing the power that is, is needed and increasing the power for more humans or getting uh, ending energy poverty. Uh, today, I love Chris Wright when he said, let's end energy poverty by 2050 rather than go to carbon net zero by 2050. Seems like a better goal to me. So let's go ahead and come in here. There's a couple things in this article. Miss Producer, if you could slide in the chart uh, in the middle with the CO2 and it has a, um, a coal plant. I'm just going to guess there in the left-hand side, as you slide that over and you say, Hey, what do you do? You can either capture it or you can see uh, sequestration and it just, you put it back into the ground. If you utilize it, you'll go to conversion, you'll mineralize, you'll go through that. You bring in, uh, liquid fuels, pol um, polymers, uh, you mix, uh, mix it into concrete. If you, uh, go one, uh, down one Avenue, um, if you use it, CCU, uh, carbon, as a, um, a carbon capture and utilization is used a lot in oil, uh, and gas enhanced recovery. So in my opinion, though, I think that the way that Occidental Petroleum has started going and they have done a great job leading the way in carbon capture and that technology to get to the tax credits. Personally, I think that the dollar per um, uh, waste or dollar per impact on the environment is best not served by spending it on ca carbon capture, but going to either nuclear or reducing uh, the the use or not necessarily spending all the money on capture. Um, I really want to open this up as an open discussion. And again, I hope everybody likes, subscribes, share, um, share this with a friend. Uh, we want to hear from you what is important to you. If you're an industry expert and you would like to come on our podcast, I would love to visit with anybody in the energy sector about almost anything. Thanks. Have an absolutely wonderful day. Talk to you tomorrow.